Okay, so this is uh, our presentation that we're going to do on Deceit Desire on, on the no uh, in the novel. If you watch the last one, we did we went and watch uh, went through uh, the whole of battling to the end, and in this one, we're going to do Gerard's work, Deceit Desire in the novel. Um, uh, the outline is based the outline and the structure is going to be basically the same. We're going to go chapter by chapter and kind of explore and unpack uh, the different arguments and evidence that Gerard gives throughout the throughout the text. In this one, uh, it's very quote heavy. Uh, I was pretty quote heavy in Oshiver Clausewitz, and I don't normally like you know, simply reading off, um, off of slides, but, uh, Gerard's quotes are really spectacular and there's, there's, uh, a bunch that I think are good to, to bring out, um, and to highlight in order to, to go through to show his concepts. It is an absolutely, of course, absolutely spectacular work. Um, here we'll go to the introduction. Um, it was the very first of, of Gerard's, uh, uh, full, uh, uh, its first published book. Um, it was published in 1961, originally in French, uh, and the English edition came out a few years later in 1966. Um, the, I mean, this book is kind of the origin that gets everything else going in terms of the rest of Girard's work throughout the rest of his career. It is his uh, singular um, uh, great insight, and indeed uh, the insight that has and uh, is and certainly will change the entire landscape of um, you know, the entire, well, depends how, depends how, uh, how, how large you would want, you would, you would want to widen the scope. Certainly the whole of the humanities, social sciences, psychology, um, but, uh, it certainly seems to be, um, one of, uh, if not the greatest, uh, 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 intellectual achievements in the entirety of, of human intellectual history. It's, um, uh, truly spectacular in terms of it, in terms of what it's able to finally solve and finally disclose. Uh, if we like mimetic, uh, m the the mimetic hypothesis, the mimetic theory of desire, um, gives us the first true psychology of desire. So you know we had, uh, you know Freud kind of inaugurated um, the psychology of desire. Uh, and the domain of, of psychology, and that remained, uh, and there was always an aspirational yearning for a for a true psychology of desire. There was a classical model going, you know, all the way back, um, uh, you know, certainly in Plato, um, and then through, uh, you know, the Stoics. They they very hev heavily emphasized psychological theory, uh, and the and the rest of philosophy um, as well. Although sometimes it's not articulated specifically as psychology, there's an attempt to kind of develop a psychology a psychological theory. You can think of the works of Locke and Berkeley and Hume um, uh, and a whole bunch of other movements within early modern philosophy and Hegel especially attempt to develop and integrate what would be um, um, uh, you know the order of the will and and also uh, explaining at the same time the nature and origins of man what man wants and why he wants it and so it was Girard for the first time we get this very different uh, picture and model of how it is that that psychology actually functions and so the first true psychological theoretical framework that's able to unify um, uh, the different uh, particular insights of psychology and integrate those into a unified theory in the same way similarly that Darwin was able to do for at least a vast swath of, of biology so within this text, he's going to go through and he's going to highlight both desire from an individual perspective, although it is, we're going to see, obviously it's, it's, uh, interesting to, to talk about it in individual terms, but at a, at a local and a particular, uh, particularly instantiated context, especially within the novel. Um, but then also look, he's going to at the same time examine the progression of desire through the examination of historical threads. And it's this progression of desire at both the individual and the historical level, which is going to be so profound and so insightful in terms of generating the full spectrum of psychopathy pathology that the desire is able to um, kick up and and generate um, there's some intimation I mean at this point there's some intimation of of the scapegoat mechanism there's certainly thought uh, on desire within history um, I was actually surprised in reading it for the first time um, uh, how straightforwardly apologetic it was um, you know I thought that Gerard's kind of first uh, apologetic work was 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 things was things hidden certainly uh, I think I think I read uh, uh, violence in the sacred first so when, you know in violence in the sacred it's it's very much presented as a kind of secular scientific theory um, there isn't very much that could be construed apologetically but here within the scope of novelistic conversion that Gerard is developing 
developing and the objective insight that gets developed from the possibility of conversion of the experience that the great novelists go through, um, it really is uh, as much a, 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 a scientific psychology of desire, but at the same time also shows the way to, to therapy and what therapy would actually consist in for your ordinary subject. Um, the data that Gerard is using to uh, show and to prove his theory is uh, the work of the modern novel. So you could say that the modern novel, I mean, it's difficult to say when it begins exactly. The Renaissance is probably, the, you know, a, a very uncontroversial time to, you could also say maybe in the high medieval period with the romances that get developed then. Um, but certainly, you know, in the Renaissance and by the time of Shakespeare, you get the, the emergence of what will be the modern novel. Um, and then Gerard is going to go through and and draw from the analyses of, of, the ninth, of, of the modern novel proper, which is the 18th and, and 19th century novels uh, uh, in particular in this work. So it's going to be a particular examination of uh, these different works that we consider to be great um, and of course Gerard the, the discovery of mimetic desire um, as is fairly well known was made rather accidentally Gerard was um, uh, conscripted to teach a, uh, a great a great works uh, course examining uh, you know just just teaching the great the novels from the great canon um, and very much in contrast to the to the intellectual trend of his time, um, rather than seeking to find out what made each work unique and particular, was instead interested in um, finding the underlying and unifying theme of greatness. That uh, you know, why are these works considered to be great in the first place, rather than um, uh, you know your 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 pop uh, best selling paperbacks that you might find uh, uh, in in bookstores or something like that. Why are why are these novels considered to be classic? Why are they considered to be great? Um, uh, what insight do they have that they might be trying to disclose to us? And is this insight a kind of knowledge? And indeed, um, Girard is able to, to through examining through examining them and through and through discovering what it is and unifying what it is that they're trying to disclose and to formulate that theoretically is able to offer us then the the theory of mimetic desire. Okay, so here we'll jump it right into to chapter one, and again we'll go chapter by chapter through the text. Um, uh, most of the conceptual structure of of what will be in the book is already contained in chapter one, and then it gets further explicated and developed later. So, um, uh, if you have no familiarity with Girard whatsoever, that's probably okay, because uh, since we're going to go over the, the the major concepts here, if it seems somewhat overwhelming, don't worry about that so much. There's going to be repetition for uh, later on um, uh, down the road, uh, but certainly these these concepts are 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 essential in terms of understanding uh, the totality of Girard's Girard work and also enable us to begin to um, if we like um, think and 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 you know, we'll come to and maybe talk about some other times Gerard's complicated relationship with philosophy or where where we can situate Gerard intellectually but um, when you have these concepts in mind you're able to then think through uh, your own experience and different sorts of uh, intellectual problems um, in novel ways right just by by thinking through from from some of the first principles that are develop, developed here so um, what Girard is, no, is, is pointing us to and noticing straight off the bat and what uh, uh, the contrast um, uh, that Cervant and Don Quixote is, is attempting to illustrate is that within um, the older order, the, within the pre-modern order uh, as it's coming to be, there is this mode by which people desire um, and this mode with, by which people desire is through open imitation of models, right? So Don Quixote's model is, of course, a, 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 a modus of Gaul. Uh, he's, he's from the, the chivalric Rome romances and he's the, the the model of the of the perfect knight and so um, uh, the claim from there the quote from Don Quixote here is thus my friend Sancho I reckon that whoever imitates him that is a modest best will come closest to perfect chivalry so um, he, already within this quote we can see the origin of, of desire uh, uh, for the hero within the novel uh, with the, the, the the nature of desire as it proceeds for 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 all of us um, and also the intimation of the fact that desire is all ultimately grasping for a kind of being from the model, right? An, an, an apparent or even indeed some cases actual superiority of being um, that is within the model that is attempted to be appropriated through, through imitation. So Girard's great discovery here is rather than, and this is the, in, this is the within the vast overwhelming, um, uh, nearly all of, of psychological theorizing, 
believes in some kind of self-originating uh, structure for desire, that desire proceeds from a subject to an object of desire, um, and that the, usually there's some kind of um, a structure from the, that, 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 that exists within the subject that then explains why it is that this object or another object is, is chosen and how it is that it is pursued. So, for instance, within Freud, this is the Oedipus complex, and it's through the structuring of the complex that the individual develops and then predicts the scope of the of the maturation of their psychology and why and how they pursue these different kinds of objects within the classical tradition you know if you're thinking of plato you have you know reason appetite and aggression and it's from the interplay of these three forces within the subject that uh, the uh, or the whole mode of human desiring is able is able to be uh, explained gerard's great discovery within the great novelists is that desire is in fact actually mediated so this so the desire doesn't spring up as a as an organic spontaneous well spring from within the subject but is rather mediated and copied by the subject and then the, that is actually the, the the origin place of of our desires and so of course you may have seen this uh this diagram before i, I borrowed it from someone else's Gerard presentation um um, uh, so you have uh, a subject, you know, A or B, um, and then sub, let's say subject B is desiring an object of desire. Uh, this causes uh, subject A to copy uh, uh, that desire. So, uh, subject A's desire is then picked up by by subject B, and this is assuming that these that these desires are these people, these subjects are in close proximity to each other, where their desires can actually be exchanged and reciprocated. So rival B's original desire is then. Uh, is, is copied by A, and then A's desire then intensifies the desire of, of, of uh, subject B, so on and so forth, towards the same object of desire. So there's a convergence of the two subjects towards the same object, and it's and this conversion, uh, conversion, uh, 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 not conversion in the, in the in the spiritual sense, but this uh, 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 conversion convergence towards the, sa the the same objects produces um, um, a, a reduction in the distance between the two subjects. So this distance isn't you know obviously physical distance is a factor but it's primarily as Gerard puts it spiritual distance that exists between the between the two subjects the closeness by which they are uh, drawn uh, to each other uh, through having both of their desires for the same object being reciprocally mediated this might seem really theoretical and abstract it, uh, I mean you can think of an object in the world as some kind of you know actual physical object of the uh, uh, in the world um, uh, uh, but also these objects can be abstract. They can be uh, they can be different tokens of prestige or symbolic objects, um, and they can even be the kind of um, um, a status of desiring itself, which is we're going to see and, and explore produces a whole uh, host of phenomena within the landscape of of desire, um, and this both gets copied and imitated without realizing that it's being copied or imitated, and each subject thinking that it's a, a unique phenomena uh, arising originally from themselves. So mediator, uh, uh, triangular structure of desire, and uh, the reality of the distance between, between the, the, the different subjects are the essential components to take away here. Um, Gerard is, you know, the first one of the first uh, instances that he's drawing out from from um, uh, the the text is the Stendhalian uh, notion of vanity and a, a vain person or a vain or a vain subject. Uh, if you know, vanity is his word for for this kind of copied desire uh, within within the text. A vain subject is only desiring an object that is already desired by another. So you can think of, in, uh, you know, in the classical world, and in, well, less so in the classical world actually, although it's still more present. Um, uh, certainly within the the Christian uh, uh, the Christian world, the medieval world. Um, you know, artists wouldn't even put their their names uh, on works of art. It was it was it was something that was done solely for the glory of God. It was done as a, a, an attempt to reproduce or to highlight or to instantiate some kind of reality in the spiritual order or in nature, uh, or both together. Um, and you know, later on in the Renaissance, artists begin to, of course, sign their works. And within within that movement, that simple movement right there of attaching one's own name and and reputation to a particular work, already vanity comes comes into play. Wherein perfect uh, uh, expression, artistic expression, was was present before artistic expression for the glory of some, uh, especially higher ideal or God, um, uh, was, was 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 integrated into 
the practice of creating art or creating beauty before. Now, within the Renaissance, it becomes much, it, you could already see the slide towards uh, who, is, who is the person who created it as adding the additional prestige uh, to the object. So it's not just solely the beauty of the object itself, although, of course, many of the works uh, created by these great artists are, are, are exceptionally beautiful and indeed some of the greatest uh, works of art that have ever been created. Um, but already you see this transfiguration of the object from, from what it is simply presenting itself as, as already being augmented by the, 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 the presence of the mediator being attached to the object. And so the vanity is the surplus of, of, of prestige that goes into through the attaching of, of a mediator to, a, to an object of desire. So, because of this fact that 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 desire that the two people who are desiring the same objects and copying each other's desires and reciprocating each other's desires are going to converge towards the same objects, um, there's going to be this this flip side towards a, a, a desire that will um, uh, be responsible for all of the uh, double phenomena that are associated with with desire. You know, if you're going to read any poetic works, you'll find um, this uh, coincidence of opposites or the highlight of opposite of, of of total oppositions, and this and this will seem exceptionally meaningful and exceptionally poignant and especially interesting um, to the way in which we uh, uh, look at the world. Sometimes extremely threatening and extremely peaceful at the at the at the same time. All of these uh, vibrant contrasts are springing forth from, or and are also part and package of uh, the the generation of uh, uh, um, uh, this more malevolent side of, of of our desire, which we originally take. You know, we think of our desire as kind of innocent and good, um, and indeed it is it is good um although 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 certainly not entirely innocent um but um uh, although it has a certain kind of uh, of actual innocence at least at its uh, uh, towards its, its its originating point but becomes much less and less innocent later on obviously is that once and the reason for that within within uh, uh, uh within mimesis is that once um the 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 the, the desires get exchanged, the, the first model who you could say originally desired the object will then attempt to thwart the ambitions of the other one who is proceeding towards the same object. And so the model becomes both the model who is indicating the that the object is desirable and at the same time uh, try attempting to block access to that same object. And it is from there, both wanting and being unable to possess, uh, that you get the real phenomena of desire. So desire is both you know the expression of wanting and also the repression of that wanting, and that's where you get the the, the phenomenon of desire blooming uh, blooming forth. And so the quote here from the text: uh, the model shows his disciple the gate of paradise, that is the object of desire, and forbids him to enter with one in the same gesture. Um, so, and finally here with distance and, 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 and mediation is that we can see the intensity of, we already talked about, uh, the intensity of desire as a result of the distance, but, uh, measurable as the distance between, uh, mediators. And indeed it's interesting from uh, a theoretical point of, point of view to think about, you know, the, the specifically, uh, geometric nature of, of desire, the ability to, to, the ability to understand it geometrically is, is somewhat, is somewhat interesting. Anyway, I'll, I'll, we'll say we'll, we, we will come back to distance in a few slides, and and we'll certainly be looking at the importance of distance throughout the throughout the rest. Um, so with the, the here, here we're here we're going to say a lot more about the model obstacle, and then some some features of the model obstacle, um, uh, and 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 the generation of the rest of of psychopathology uh, is going to follow for the next little bit. So. You know, if you think back to uh, Sancho imitating Amadis, or not Sancho, Sancho's imitating Don Quixote, obviously, but, but Don Quixote Im imitating Amadis of Gaul, um, uh, uh, Amadis of Gaul is not going to enter into rivalry with Don Quixote, right? For, for Don Quixote, uh, Amadis is, you know, he's, he's inhabiting the land of the blessed. He can only shine a benevolent source, uh, uh, source of interpretation and meaning, and meaning onto all things. Uh, he can't enter, the, because they can't enter into rivalry, because the desires can't be copied and exchanged because they can't imagine being in the same worlds. Um, um, uh, for this, uh, in, within this kind of structure, Gerard will 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 uh, make a distinction between internal and external mediation. So, an externally mediated desire is one where the distance, uh, the spiritual distance between the two subjects, uh, is is great enough that it's it's unlikely or impossible for their desires to really be intensified or reciprocally in exchanged. Um, and so, this this 
results one of the one of the uh, uh this has this is actual concrete specific mechanical effects in terms of uh the way in which the poten potential for psychopathology can can proceed one immediate effect which is very interesting is that within external mediation you can say that you're openly imitating right don quixote can say that he's openly imitating a modest of gaul whereas within uh internal mediation where there is rivalry over the disputed object and where desires are being uh, exchanged there's the denial of of imitation altogether and we have a great quote for that coming up on on the next slide so it is from uh, internal mediation that we can actually explain um, uh, all of these apparently uh, uh, very difficult or impossible to explain or to integrate or to uh, make systematic or mechanical uh, features that we ordinarily associate with desire. Uh, so especially in terms of understanding the role of the model obstacle, we can understand the generation of hatred, um, what envy is and how it is that envy is actually driving so much of our desires and subjectivity, the origins of ambivalence. So this is the feature of our models where our model obstacles where we both adore and despise them they're worshipped they're detested and also the fondness uh, for rivals so people who have intense passionate hatred for each other and they uh, pursue um, you know even unlimited ends and to, to defeat their to defeat their rivals but at the same time they have a, a strange um, a latent affection for them as well um, uh, I can't remember I think it was um, uh, uh, the Austrian emperor who was saying of Napoleon there was you know there was no greater honor than being beaten eaten by Napoleon in the field, right? That this is, uh, this is, this is the same kind of uh, 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 prestige uh, or fondness that gets attached to, to rivals from being both models uh, and obstacles. And so we have, so we have uh, um, uh, two quotes here. I'm not sure whether to do the quotes or to talk about um, the, the systematic outline of desire. Um, so I, we'll do the systematic outline first. So, so, so just to get the kind of steps uh, clear, um, so first, you know, there's the the object. The, the object is is indicated as desirable by a subject. The other subject copies that desire. Uh, if he there's there's two there's two sort of, there's a, there's a flow chart if we want in terms of what takes place whether or not the subject is able to defeat his model or to gain mastery over the object fr and wrestle it from uh, from the subject. But in let's say in the ordinary case that it's a, that it's a failure to actually obtain the object. Um, then um, uh, the subject is going to uh, uh, devalue himself, right? He's going to uh, he's going to regard himself as secretly inferior to his model. This uh, the secret inferiority is not something he's likely to disclose to to his rival, but it's a feeling of of secret inferiority that he's going to nevertheless uh, carry within himself, um, and he's going to you know uh, secretly both adore and despise uh, his model at the same time. If he feels like he's getting closer to defeating his model rival. Uh, in possession of of the object that is designated as as desirable, then he's going. Then there's going to be an intense bursting forth of euphoria and and uh, and and mania, and you get this kind of oscillation of extremes back and forth, wherein um, uh, you know you feel both at the superhuman heights and crushed beneath all uh, uh, all of reality uh, in terms of the relationship of the distance towards actually being able to obtain the object. If this persists for long enough, the actual object itself, what seems to be indicating the specific prestige that is that is generated or the reason for the fight in the first place um will fall away entirely and uh the rivals will be consumed entirely with um uh, uh the model uh, the model him or herself right so it will just be about uh the being of of the other as the only thing that that really that that really matters when this intensifies even further the mediator tends to extend out onto all things and usually from a rivalrous uh, uh it's usually very i mean again you get this oscillation effect uh between mania and depression uh or mania and anxiety and mania mania and hostility that takes place. Um, um, but the mediator seems to take over the whole of, of, of reality. And in this case, uh, the mediators can jump uh, um, uh, quite rapidly, as we'll see, and, and we get towards the end, which is, you know, the Dostoevsky and kind of explosion uh, of doubling, which takes place. And this, and within this explosion actually reveals uh, the double nature of desire itself, as, as Gerard will, will come to see, especially from the analysis of the works of Dostoevsky, but, in, but importantly in Proust as well. 
Um, so now we get to the quotes. Only someone who prevents us from satisfying a desire which he himself has inspired in us is truly an object of hatred. The person who hates first hates himself for the secret admiration concealed by this hatred. In an effort to hide this desperate admiration from others and from himself, he no longer wants to see in his mediator anything but an obstacle. The secondary role of his mediator thus becomes primary, concealing his original function of a model scrupulously imitated. So at first, you have this uh, mode of apprenticeship wherein there's open copying and admiration for the model within the within within the within the space of mimetic rivalry of uh, uh, though um, the rival op- o- occupies the foreground and it's it's just envy um, uh, detestation and hatred that, that 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 primarily occupies the foreground and indeed from that from which most of the statements are are actually uttered um, right so there's there's you know there's a kind there as as, as we'll see uh, I think it's on the next slide in looking in looking at envy um, you know there's there's a lot of uh, 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 anger and resentment dedicated towards uh, certain classes of people by other classes of people and obviously there's there's some kind of thwarting of an object of desire that's going on there that's causing you know this 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 really intense uh, hatred and resentment uh, uh, to manifest itself in all kinds of violent language and actions perhaps the more important part of Girard's main discovery and innovation isn't merely social learning or reciprocal altruism so there's been a lot of theorists who have noticed that human beings learn by imitation that we're imitative creatures um, um, you know something like reciprocal altruism or reciprocal hatred if I'm nice to you then you'll be nice to me and if I'm hostile to you then you'll be hostile to me uh, uh, this isn't been placed centrally in terms of the position of the mediator indeed it's in a, it's weirdly still seen as kind of uh, individualistic within a lot of these theories, even though it's copying and social learning. Um, anthropologists outside of the Girardian domain will recognize social learning as the real secret to human success. So within evolutionary biology, for a species to, to uh, generate a new um, um, a possible mode of being within the world, it has to go through a process of, of, of mutation and adaptation and selection and getting coded genetically before this new kind of behavior or pattern is able to manifest broadly. I mean, it's not always, but that's the broad picture biologically. Um, for human beings, however, new information and new habits and uh, new insights and new patterns can actually be transmitted extra genetically simply through the process of social learning. So this is the secret of our, of our success in terms of um, uh, the origin of, of human beings. So that's all, that's kind of recognized. It was suppressed a little bit. It came more into fashion um, a little uh, 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 more recently th- uh, in terms of the wider study of evil of of, of evolution. Um, but um, um, you know, for Girard, maybe perhaps what's even more important is, is, or alongside with the the presence of the mediator, is the mediator as obstacle, right? So it's the gener it's the generation of not just you know um, uh, ordinary like reciprocal uh, goodness or badness, but rather that the goodness and badness get packaged together within the presence of of the mediator, um, and 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 it's the, the the all of the psychopathology that is generated generated through this relationship of opposition within the within the within the obstacle that is maybe um, uh, the more and of course unifying all of this theoretically is 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 his own characteristic and unique genius but um um, uh, 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 you know that seems to be uh, the the insight that is that has not at all been noticed by by the rest of of anyone who's come to think about the subject um so Girard kind of turns within with, within the chapter and examines um, uh, you know the theorists of envy and uh, and resentment uh, you know principally Nietzsche right so so Nietzsche as this kind of arch individualist right this the 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 strong person is the person who has brings up his own desires from self origination within the self and goes out to take on his own uh, designated obstacles and through this uh, uh, struggle becomes triumphant or uh, and may and meaningful um, in a in a meaningless uh, and pointless universe, um, and so um, you know Girard's critique of of, of all of the and 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 I mean and here specifically Nietzsche is 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 designating a whole class of others as those who are envious, right? It's the weak, uh, those who are filled with resentment, the herd. Um, uh, they're they're the they are the others. They're the ones who are who are the who are who are who are the ones who are merely imitating. But in fact, what Girard wants to say is no Nietzsche and the and this sort of um, uh, Nietzschean Superman is actually 
way more mimetic and way more imitative than than the rest of the uh, rest of their, or at least uh, their 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 imitation they're they're all equally mimetic but their imitation is much more uh, hostile and aggressive and, in and intensely experienced than it is for the um uh, if you like the tourists of of desire within within the the ordinary herd of persons so uh, a wonderful quote here um uh, and so, I mean, Girard's the theoretical, the, the simple theoretical critique is that Nietzsche and those following after him, um, uh, uh, rather than locate the source of desire as, as you know, arising up from within the uh, characteristics of the individual, himself, him or herself, instead um, uh, missing entirely the presence of the mediator in conferring desire upon, upon the subject. So... Um, uh, 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 missing, missing the centrality of the mediator, they fail to realize that possession of the object is a merely passive obstacle. It is frustrating and seems a deliberate expression of contempt only because the rival is secretly revered. The demigod seems to answer homage with a curse. He seems to render evil for good. The subject would like to think of himself as a victim of an atrocious injustice, but in his anguish he wonders whether perhaps he does not deserve his apparent condemnation. Rivalry therefore only aggravates mediation. It increases the mediator's prestige and strengthens the bond which links the object to, it, to this mediator by forcing him to affirm openly his right or desire of possession. Thus the subject is less capable than ever of giving up the inaccessible object. It is on this object and this, and this object alone that the mediator confers his prestige. By possessing or wanting to possess it, all other objects are of no worth at all in the eyes of the envious person. So it's actually within the, 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 the eclipsing of all possible desires onto this particular uh, object designated by a mediator um, um, that 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 the only meaning is possibly generated, and that this subject, who's supposed to be the most free and the most liberated, is actually the most bound and determined, and uh, uh, with living within the 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 worst of the hellish landscape of the intensity of internal mediation. Um, this hero of internal mediation, far from boasting of his efforts to imitate, carefully hides them. Fascinated by his model, the disciple inevitably sees in the mechanical obstacle which he puts in his way proof of the ill will born him. Far from declaring himself a faithful vassal, he thinks only of repudiating the bonds of mediation. But these bonds are stronger than ever, for the mediator's apparent hostility does not diminish his prestige, but instead augments it. The subject is convinced that the model considers himself too superior to be, to be a disciple. The subject is torn between two opposite feelings toward his model, the most of reference and the most intense malice. This is the passion that we call hatred. And so this, this hatred, far from belonging to the categories of, of uh, uh, those who, who uh, we, um, we can't use the term scapegoat yet, but, but those who Nietzsche would, 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 would scapegoat, um, uh, it, instead it's, the, it's of course the Nietzschean Superman who feels this most uh, submissive reference and most intense malice and this most intense passion, uh, hatred more, more than anyone else. Um, so the whole mistake that the people have been making, um, both in the, if you like, in the philosophical stream throughout Nietzsche from Descartes onward, um, uh, uh, all the way to Nietzsche, uh, and all of the the novelists whose works are not great or who are are not yet great, um, is that th they f they fail to realize that desire proceeds from from the mediator. So they all think that the the the, the uh, and they all show and attempt to to illustrate within their work um, that their, their desires are are unique and specific to them that they have self-originated them, um, um, uh, 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 they are arising from their own um, uh, romantic spontaneity and the brilliance of their own ego or from you know, their own tr uh, un unique transvaluation of values and their own superhuman strength as they obliterate all the, uh, through all of the different obstacles. Um, the, the, these, the, this wellspring is proceeding um, um, from within themselves. So this, for Girard, he's going to designate as romantic uh, uh, desire. In contrast with this, is novelistic desire, right? Which uh, 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 novelistic desire is the illustration of the reality of the mediator within the text. So it's the disclosure of the mimetic nature of desire, um, which is then illustrated by the novelist. And it's in these works that the it is these works in particular that we call great for their capacity to reveal uh, the way in which desire actually proceeds, rather than from the way in which the ego of desire would like desire to pr proceed, or the, the or from the point of view you from which the ego can inflate its own pride in terms of uh, 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 its uh, the, the the pattern of desire of imitation so it's both it's weird because there's as we'll come to see in, in later chapters in the, in in a, uh, 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 in a chapter on Stendhal there's this weird desire for the sake of desire a for the sake of desire um, 
that is partly conscious at certain at certain, at certain mo moments, but is actually mostly it seems unconscious. It seems like a um, uh, something that uh, you know takes place as part and parcel of desire, failing to realize uh, the reality of the mediator driving everything. And I think at least at least part of that story has to do with the fact that our desire is mimetic. It really is copied from from others, but it's experienced individually, right? So um, uh, it does seem at least superficially that you can recognize. Um, uh, you know some of the, the 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 automatic playing out of the process of desire as it denies uh, desire that it has and, you know, as a, arising as a as a if you like an instinctual response to the the distance being closed uh, uh, from from the mediators maybe one another way to think about it um, and perhaps another way to think about it is 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 from the uh, original instinctual uh, structure from which desire proceeds originally but that would be you know maybe that would be a better better thing to discuss in if we were looking at I don't know things hidden or something like that. Um, uh, yeah, so we'll just go straight to the quote. Don Quixote proclaimed himself the disciple of Amadis, and the writers of his time proclaimed themselves to be the disciples of the ancients. The romantic Vanito does not want to be anyone's disciple. He convinces himself that he is thoroughly original. In the 19th century, spontaneity becomes a universal dogma, succeeding imitation. Stendhal warns us that every step that we must not be fooled by these individualisms professed with fanfare, for they merely hide a new form of imitation. Romantic revulsion, hatred of society, nostalgia for the desert, just as gregariousness, usually a concern for the morbid concern of the other and what we also notice is uh, is on top of all of that the reason for um, the refusal to uh, uh, one of the additional reasons that we'll see we'll see you know how it is that copying desire actually produces this whole structure but as well people don't want to reveal their own uh, lack of uniqueness in terms of their own desire by by acknowledging the imitation of anyone else so you can actually see that rather than producing a whole bunch of originality it actually ends up producing not very much at all because no one can, no one can, no one's actually able to acknowledge um, uh, any kind of of tribute to anyone else or or the horror of having whatever they've produced end up looking or resembling um, that which anyone else is doing as it would show you know their lack of uh, uh, it would it would show um, that they are not a supremely intact model that seems desirable for others to imitate. And again, this is it's weird because this is something that um, the more mimetic especially uh, know intuitively but are unable to, to isolate and then to articulate uh, uh, theoretically. Um, and then this quote, which is just... Um, you know, you have to wonder whether or not Gerard went 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 too far here, uh, but um, it is uh, it is something that that even if it's not true, and 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 there is at least I think some 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 great substantial truth to it. But even if it were not true in its in its entirety, um, it is it is certainly worth uh, meditating upon. Um, so subjectivism and objectivism, romanticism and realism, individualism and scientism, idealism and positivism appear to be in opposition, but are secretly in, agree in agreement to conceal the presence of the mediator. All these dogmas are the aesthetic or philosophical translation of worldviews peculiar to internal mediation. They all depend directly or indirectly on the lie of spontaneous desire. So instead of acknowledging the presence of the mediator in the generation of reality for the subject, we get into you know all of these different kinds of, of theoretical approaches that are more or less based on starting with uh, uh, the the subject from which you know all of reality reality is then emerging or is constructed in one way or another. So you can think of like, you know, the whole Kantian system of developing the entirety of reality from the deductions of the of the of subjectivity of the subject of the like this is this for sure art is just one big enterprise um, in the uh, in 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 the denial of the presence of the mediator who's doing the actual construction of the world uh, 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 for the subject. So um, Savage quote, very interesting quote, um, and 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 uh, with with some 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 uh, very heavy uh, uh, theoretical implications. Uh, if it turns out to be entirely true, it's certainly at least partially true. Uh, and, uh, and also, you as well, you know, all of the rivalries that are constituted uh, by the, the 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 relationship of opposition through the articulation of a theoretical uh, uh, picture as well. So, like, that's the more ordinary kind of thing that we can that that people recognize in terms of um, uh, the theoretical landscape uh, but uh, Girard is, is of course saying something uh, uh, much more interesting as well on top of that so you know this this whole 
what what you know if we like there's the world as the world really is but then there's the world as augmented uh, uh by desire and so for this uh, you know what what many of the great novelists are pointing to or attempting to show is this transfiguration of reality through desire right so the mediator's prestige is imparted to the object of desire and confers upon it an illusory value of illusory value triangular desire is the desire which transfigures its object romantic literature does not disregard this metamorphosis on the contrary it turns it on it turns it turns to account and boasts of it, but never reveals its actual mechanism. The illusion is a living being whose conception demands a male and female element. The poet's imagination is the female, which remains sterile as long as it's not fertilized by the mediator. So it's a wonderful image that Gerard put together there. The novelist alone describes this actual genesis of the illusion, uh, spelling mistake, for which romanticism makes the poet alone responsible. So within romanticism, of course, it's the ego that is supposed to transform all of reality. And indeed, desire is transformed transforming all of reality, but it's not realizing that the operation of the ego is actually mediated to the ego in the first place. So there's a, there's a, there's a missing link in terms of the, the uh, ability to understand and explain how it is that this transfiguration of reality through desire is actually taking place. Um, and in, and in these great works that Gerard is, and he uses more examples of the text, but two that, he's, that he, that he um, highlights within the text is uh, uh, the, the, the nature of the salons um, uh, uh, um, uh, in the works of as a Stendhal or Proust. I should say, one of my major um, uh, disadvantages in coming to this text and <laughs> doing this presentation is that I've read Dostoevsky's works. I'm actually not uh, all that familiar with a lot of the other great works that Gerard is, and, and great authors that Gerard is drawing from. My background is mostly in, 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 in philosophy and in the rest of the domains attached to philosophy. It hasn't so much been in uh, in reading in reading uh, literature, um, and so I'm at a slight disadvantage. And, and although there's some references within the text that are just lost on me uh, as as going through, but uh, uh, nevertheless, uh, the, the the theoretical picture is 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 quite clear. Um, and so hope, you know, hopefully you can you can indulge me that 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 weakness, and we can and we can move on. Um, but um, the salons, of course, these are the these are the, the the salons of the aristocracy and the the the, the bourgeois who are who are who are more well to do and more ambitious. Um, these are where the who's who are coming together to discuss ideas. But of course, what's articulated is, is is it's not the ideas that are being discussed in the salon that makes them really interesting, but rather simply the games of prestige and the and the and the and, and the enclosure of the salon. It's exclusivity in terms of who gets admitted, who's in and who's out, and the gossip between rival salons. Um, uh, uh, that is, in fact, you know, driving uh, the apparent prestige uh, that that appears to go along with them, and the, and uh, uh, as well, um, um, uh, the instance of Don Quixote fighting over the the barbers, what is an ordinary barber's ba basin, but through the relationship of opposition and struggle, turns into the hel helmet of the great Rambrino, which is which is you know the object that is that is uh, that is the supremely valuable object, simply generated through this relationship of opposition. So it's the great work which is able to. Um, actually disclose uh, with, with, a, with a good deal of humor um, uh, you know what it is that's actually going on in terms of how it is that meaning is really generated and how it is the desire uh, and uh, transfigures the, uh, or appears to transfigure the world. So each and every time, Proustian desires the triumph of suggestion over impression. It is true that the source of the transfiguration is within us, but the spring gushes forth only when the mediator strikes the rock with his magic wand. It's, and in this quote, I mean, you know, I think I've said it before in another presentation, but it's, you know, it would be one thing if Gerard was just the, the you know, his, his, uh, his brilliance as a theoretician, but he's also, um, uh, he's also a brilliant writer as well, um, and, uh, and, has, and has some of his own um, wit and, and humor uh, 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 littered throughout most of his works. Um, it is a transfiguration of the desired object by the mediator, which constitutes the unity of external and internal mediation. So rather that you can't make this totally clear cut uh, separation and division between internal and external mediation, they're both byproducts of desire, right? So there is this continuum even within this, even within the space of external and in, uh, external mediation. Um, uh, and it and it shows uh, the unity of the process. So even in the case of, and, and the reference here will become more explicit, is even, in, I think it's on the next slide, um, 
even in the case of Don Quixote, where the the the, the passion is not pathological, um, um, and even where uh, 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 you know it seems pacific and benign, um, it is still the same process of transfiguration by the mediator that's taking place within the scope of external and 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 internal mediation. So it's a it's a unity of a of a phenomena. Um, okay, so this is the the the. Um, the whole so talking about the unity of the phenomena between internal and external mediation, and now we have the unity of phenomena in terms of the progression of desire. So it's though there is different authors are presenting desire differently in all kinds of different works. Um, there is a unity of of the disclosure of mimesis that unites them, but there is an intensity of desire or an aggravation of desire that is pr that is that is shown differently uh, uh, throughout throughout the different works. It varies, right? So Proust has some works that are more intense and less intense, for example. Um, but in general, Girard wants to, wants to look at these different works, highlight that the, that the, the specific factor that shows the, the difference in terms of the um, illustration is that, it, that, is, that, is, that, is, that is done by the author within the work is, is a factor of the distance that takes place between the, the, different, the different subjects. So um, really amazing um um uh you know uh, uh, I, I mean it's hard to it's it's hard to really appreciate the, the the theoretical importance of having a kind of science of subjectivity or a science of of of, of the subjectivity of desire if we like but it, but here you go you can have uh, this this pretty this pretty straightforward um and and fairly precise and recognizable spectrum of desire um that can be that can be shown and understood through the relationship of distance between between the subjects so it's all dependent upon the, the, the proximity to the mediator. And from here you get, right, I mean, Proust talks again and again in his works about his laws, right? The laws of desire. This isn't just some spontaneous, um, uh, unique individual phenomena that has, uh, you know, a potential for infinite variety uh, according to the infinite variety of, of personalities that belong to, to each, in, each individual person. But instead there are these psychological laws of desire from which then one can understand what it is that is Objectively taking place uh, within the other subjects, so, you know, the, the 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 complete closure of something like like behavioralism, right? The impossibility of knowing what's going on within the the, the subjectivity of the other, and also not like you know the kind of um, uh, the alternative, which is like the 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 armchair philosopher psychologizing in terms of uh, attempting to, to to spitball what's going on uh, from the arrangement of complexes, but it, but instead the actual discovery of these particular uh, real laws and from there that you're able to then actually interpret what's going on in terms of, of the subjectivity of the other and at least at least be able to interpret um, 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 with uh, uh, extraordinary clarity um, uh, the phenomena as they do as they do emerge. Uh, so Proust's laws are identical with the laws of triangular desire. They define a new type of internal mediation which occurs when the distance between the mediator and the desiring subject is even less than in Stendhal. So that there's, um, you know, there are points from which you can show um, a phenomena the desire kicks up that are specific to uh, the proximity of, of mediation. So this, roughly this, this spectrum within the text uh, that Gerard is showing goes from Cervant with uh, uh, Don Quixote and Amadis of Gaul. Um, this is externally mediated desire. It's pacific it's humorous um uh, you know you could think that don quixote is is crazy because he's he's imagining himself on this on this adventure and none of it is is really real but what servant is of course illustrating is this is most of our lives right we could, there's all kinds of structures in the world that are merely generated uh, uh if we like socially and intersubjectively but we nonetheless treat them with extreme reverence so that they are very real and that they're and <laughs> sometimes they are uh, uh 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 very real and very and very important in that sense but they are generated intersub uh, intersubjectively and so we all kind of inhabit that that, that Don Quixote uh, world but Don Quixote isn't aggressive and dangerous and on the 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 verge of murder suicide that, that you see constantly um, uh, precipitating on the edge of Dostoevsky's uh, characters who are who are possessed by desire he's 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 you know he's he's quite he's he's quite benign the only people who really need to watch out are are, 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 may, are maybe the windmills but but aside from that uh, Don Quixote is a very pacific and kind of benign mediation the mediation through which he interprets the rest of the world is this positive sort of 
um, benevolent interpretation of the phenomena that are taking place that is mediated by his model, Amadis, who is who is far away, right? Um, for Emma Bovary, she has she has Paris, so so she has her her big heroic um, you know dreams of of Prince Charming and her grand romances in Paris, but she is in her provincial town, and as long as she stays far away in her provincial town, she can imagine that the people that she encounters are these um, uh, you know grand uh, uh, grand grand and prestigious people uh, uh, from from the romances that she reads and that she imagines but her desire um is 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 much less intense than what you see going go, uh, going on uh, uh in later works with stendhal you see um you know focusing much more on uh, as we'll see when stendhal gerard uses stendhal a lot well he uses stendhal a lot in the text altogether but uh, as well in terms of imagining the political progression of desire so he's focused more on the nobility and the vanity of of, of high society and here stendhal's characters are of course more at the center right so all of that is taken place and then with proust and his and his snobism this is it is more at the center but the center has become leveled so the so so that everyone is in competition with with everyone else there is no longer this gradiating differentiation that's still somewhat present instead we'll see we'll see how this uh, there's there, some further and illuminating clarity gets presented later on but it's but it is interesting to notice the difference and then dostoevsky finally um the full emergence of modernity as maybe we could characterize it that way uh, emerges within dostoevsky's novels where not only are the equal but they are equal and in complete and total rivalry with each other as a result of have having been been made completely equal so you can also see this in terms of a historical progression. Um, there's the ancient and there's the classical world. This is a world that is mediated largely by the sacred, right? And so this is an externally mediated world. And then there's a kind of bourgeois progression that takes place. And you can think of this as the desires that are, uh, uh, well, typically bourgeois, as we'll, as we'll come to see uh, in later chapters. But as well, there's also an ordinary kind of... Um, 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 limpid humanism that is the you know it's it's the desire that doesn't desire too much um, it's the desire of tourism rather than adventure um, uh, you know this is the, the the middle ground of of desire which is no longer within the 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 sacred uh, world which is no longer within the world of the sacred um, but which hasn't reached the intensity of of modernity yet and then of course the difference in terms of 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 modernity and all that goes along with it um, so within this most intense form, and this is the, the, the objective kind of progression of, 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 of desire, and it doesn't need, so you, again, it's really interesting because you can imagine it and interpret a whole successive of historical events as they've progressed and unfolded, but, that's, but then also at the individual level in terms of, of the, the specific subject or character as well. So within the Dostoevsky, and that is the most intense of the of the doubles, the identicals of desire. In Dostoevsky, there is no longer any love without jealousy, any friendship without envy, any attraction without repulsion. The characters uh, insult each other, spit in each other's faces, and minutes later they fall at the enemy's feet. They abjectly beg for mercy. Hatred is so intense that it finally explodes, revealing its double nature, or rather the double the double role of the model and obstacle played by the mediator. Um, so the uh, now within this whole scope, you can go all the way to the kind of Dostoevsky and intensity of, of doubling, but as well there's the possibility of conversion which can take place at actually any time within this succession, but and this kind of goes all the way to Gerard's last text within uh, within Battling to the End and the and the and the series that we looked at last time. It is actually, if we like, the most likely or the most obvious wherein conversion can take place within the most extreme end in, in Dostoevsky. And in indeed, and I don't know if I have the quote within this. Uh, uh, so if I repeat the if I repeat the quote or find the actual quote, which will be of course much better than the, than than me saying it, um, is uh, um, uh, is 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 that um uh, uh i forget what i was going to say now um um this uh, uh um uh, the this uh, this process of uh, I, was, I completely forget what it was that I was going to say so we're going to go on to the next quote and maybe it'll come back to me in a second recapturing the past uh, for Proust is to welcome a truth which most men spend their lives trying to escape to recognize that one has always copied others in order to seem original in their eyes and in one's own all of this is very banal very common this holds true of everyone except us romantic pride willingly denounces the presence of the mediator and others in order to found its own autonomy on the ruins of rival pretensions pride can never reach its own mediator but the experience of the past recap captured as the death of pride, the birth of humility, and thus of truth. And so it is from the possibility of, uh, f of going all in for the ego, for the sake of the ego, all the way to the pure, to pure mediation of rivalry of the other, that the pot, uh, and so th this is, this is the, the, if you like, the pitch of the, of the romantic um, uh, mode of the progression of desire, 
is also the impossibility of actually being able to express the truth of how it is the desiring the desire is actually is actually functioning so um, it is only through going through this process of novelistic conversion that one is able to actually um, articulate objectively how it is that the desire actually functions and, and and takes place which is extremely interesting that there is this unity and convergence between both truth and if we like will or 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 or, or desire um so it's it's it, it, and it's doubly interesting, not doubling in the in the negative sense, but it's doubly interesting um, that it's something that that's takes pl that that needs to take place before an epistem uh, before this this epistemically superior position is able to be reached. So it's some, it's a it's a process of change that one has to actually undergo uh, from a subjective point of view before someone is then able to actually uh, not just see and understand, but to be able to show to others uh, how it is that it's taking place. So it's. Um, let's just say, uh, uh, to put it modestly, interesting that, that it's the case that that's the way uh, that, that, that it is. So this brings us towards the end of this. I'm really, I'm really embarrassed at the end of uh, having this point. I sorry, I had someone going, going in and out outside my apartment there, and I couldn't, uh, I couldn't, I couldn't track along with what it was I was thinking. I got distracted, um, and uh, so uh, you know, hopefully that's no problem. Uh, so in the second, in the second one, we will come to chapter two, which is men become gods in the eyes of each other, and specifically here in this next chapter, we're going to look at. Um, um, how it is that uh, it's shown that desire is desire for being. And the sounds may be really abstract, but it's going to be uh, uh, quite clear and very important and illuminating in terms of what it is that desire is actually after and how our, our intersubjective uh, relationships with each other so often um, are, 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 are pathetically constituted is maybe one way to, to, to put it. Um, uh, the banality of evil within, within our own desires. So, um, so here is a, is a beautiful painting of of uh, of Jacob wrestling with God or wrestling with an angel, um, um, and uh, and so hopefully meditating on that we can we can we we can proceed to chapter two and and I will see you there on the next one. <laughs>